I'd like to introduce Kent, who is going to introduce our What's Up speaker, or speakers. Yes, that speaker is Pearl. The subject of What's Up tonight is virtual start parties. Speaking of that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Stu Foreman, co-chair of our imaging committee, but he's brought a guest with him that he will introduce. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for uh, coming and thank you for uh, having us. Um, I just wanted to speak a little on uh, what it means by a virtual star party. And um, we've been doing this for, for many, many years where we share our images online hosted by a forum. Um, it was originally uh, hosted by, um, it was uh, conceived by um, uh, a man named Fraser Kane, who you may know from Universe Today. And this is where I met um, my special guest, which is Corey Schmitz, where he and his uh, future wife, uh, Tanya, were participating. And um, every Sunday, Cor um, uh, Fraser does a virtual star party, and this Sunday will be the last one. And I will I've posted links to that um, every week. But because we're running out of time, I'm going to turn this over to Corey. Now, Corey, can you hear me? I can. Can you All right. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So, Corey, can you first cool. tell people where you are, what time is it, and how cold it is? <laughs> well, I'm in uh, I'm in a suburb of Johannesburg, South Africa, right now. Um, it is currently 4:21 a.m. Uh, here, um, and I yeah, like it's kind of cold, you know, I'm in my house. And they don't build the houses here, like at all, to handle any sort of um, temperature variance. So when it gets cold, it gets almost down to you know freezing. So it's about zero degrees Celsius. Um, I think right now it might be hmm, somewhere around uh, five, six degrees Celsius. So it's cold. It's about that temperature in my house as well. So that's why I dressed up warmly. We usually just light fires. But <laughs> great. Um, yeah. Well, let's let's go ahead and, and sh let's go ahead and share your screen. And because we're going to lose it real quick, lose the great okay. red. Okay. So let's let's. So can can we pin Corey's screen now? Um, uh, if I can share it, it's still disabled uh, for. Oh, can you can you enable screen sharing, please, Steve? Uh, Steve, how about now? <laughs> right now. I I will do it. Okay, cool. There we go. There right. we go. And go uh, ahead and pin the screen, Steve, please. Okay. So there we go. This oh. one. So that's just that's not what he's seeing right now, just so you know. There we go. This is okay, I'll share this. We Should can see it. it. Okay, cool. So yeah, that's um what I'm gonna share now. This is this is the screen that I show on um on YouTube. Um so I did a I actually did a live stream right before this meeting, and this is my I've got several views of this. I've got, uh, this is the default view where it's me and my telescope and the zoom in view of the, of the, the planet. So this is the live view of the planet Jupiter right now. Um, this is my actual full screen view here on this side. Um, and then, so this is the telescope that we're looking through. Um, I've, I've called it the green side observatory observatory because I don't really have a, an observatory, but I have a permanent setup, um, that I basically built, um, <laughs> I built a tent frame with, and it's got three levels of um, green tarp over it. <laughs> and it keeps it, it keeps it, uh, it's rained a few times and then I've got a scope, a scope cover on inside. So I just leave it connected all the time. All I have to do is hook up the computer and go so I can be imaging in about um, five minutes or less um, any, at any point, which is good because I've been doing a lot of planetary imaging lately um, with, with that telescope and, um, and I've been sharing those views uh, online, which I was a little concerned about the view for this meeting because um, about about an hour ago, the, the scene conditions got really bad and you couldn't see much. Um, but right now it looks like we're seeing some nice stuff. Um, anyway, so this is a live view of Jupiter um, through the, the green filter. It's, it's, yeah, you can see my mouse pointer. So I, I use a monochrome camera and that means that you can never see color live with my, my setup. 
Um, the reason I do that is because I concentrate on high resolution planetary imaging. Um, and I, whenever I process those images, I'll actually send those on to um, the online virtual um, observatory databases for planetary scientists to use and utilize and look at um, if they need to. Um, and then, but other than that, it's just for the, the joy of, of imaging. But um, the planetary <laughs> stuff is what I do now, but I've done um, all of the um, deep sky imaging, solar imaging, um, lunar imaging. I've, I've done pretty much everything. Um, I've touched almost all the, the um, astrophotography areas, and this is just the current one that I'm looking at. What's that, in, Stu? Sorry. In your, um, yeah, your website is photographingspace.com, and what sort of stuff do you have on the website? Uh, so I've got over 100 tutorials um, on astrophotography on photographingspace.com. Um, I don't really need to push that marketing right now too much, but there's just a bunch of free stuff on there. It's basically just a mind, mind dump um, from the things that I've learned over the years. I started this in 2012, and um, uh, I teamed up with, I don't remember how many we've got, maybe 10 astrophotographers around the world, and we kind of just pooled our knowledge and threw it all on, on the website, and that's, that's basically what I do right now for, for my professional hobby, we'll call it. Um, and I recently started up these live streams uh, when the pandemic went on because um, obviously everybody is home all the time and I hadn't done them for a while, um, but I wanted to just share the view and give some people something to look at and it's kind of stuck. So, um, you know, while everybody doesn't have to stay home as much as they used to, it's still a thing that, that I like to share. So um, I'm going to keep it up for as long as I can. And can you talk a little bit about your equipment that you're shooting with? I will. I will I'll show it now. Okay. So what I've got is I've got a 12 inch, uh, 12 inch Richie Cretien um, telescope. Uh, so it's, it's basically like a, it, it's a Newtonian style, but, or it's like an SCT without the corrector plate on the front, let's say. And um, you can see the imaging train on the back is really, really long. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost the length of the, of the telescope tube itself. And that's basically because I've got a, a 2.5 um, Barlow power mate on the end and the camera and a filter wheel, um, all of that through. And we're seeing, I'm shooting at about 6,000 millimeters of focal length at the moment. Um, can and you a, can you put it back to, to Jupiter and um, point yes. out the features that you see before we lose yes. it? I will. Yeah, it, it's not going to go um, that far. Let's see, where am I? There we go. So yeah, it'll be there for a little bit longer. But um, so the great red spot is here. Uh, and yeah, you can see the jet stream above me is pretty bad. So that's why I'm not getting a, a, any clearer imaging image than this. But I will also enable something. So there's, if I boost that, the gamma on this, this is the moon IO right here. It um, has moved in the last 45 minutes or so. It's moved from the limb of the planet from behind, and it's actually moved out. So I've, I've been watching it pop out, out from behind the planet, which is always fun to, to see this kind of stuff as well. Um, and then, yeah, the great red spot. We've got the north equatorial band here, the southern equatorial band here. Um, the poles, there's not a whole lot of detail that you can see in the poles right now um, or ever really on a live view, but it's really hard to see, but you can see oval BA right here, <laughs> but it, it, you have to really like, it's- Do you have impossible. a, do you have a process image handy that you can share? Uh, your if you don't, that's fine. I do, I gotta load it up here quick. Let me, okay. let me grab that. Um, There we go. I've got the one I did recently. Um, let me pop that up. I suppose you might want a color one. They're always more fun. So yeah, this is um, one of my recent color ones. It was during pretty pretty poor, pretty poor seeing conditions, but um, you know a lot of these details will will definitely pop in. Um, Let's see what else. And this is a, another another recent one in infrared. Um, you can really see the features of this is the oval BA there. 
Um, the great red spot is actually, it's not red because this is a black and white infrared image. Um, but quite a bit of detail came through during that as well. Um, but yeah, that's what, you know, they'll, they'll look a, a lot better once you process them and the, the live, the live video feed isn't, isn't all that exciting. Um, just because, you know, everybody worry that they, they, they want to see, you know, the color and they want to see the features sharp and, um, and everything. But the thing is, you know, you're really limited by the atmosphere and everything. Um, and the jet stream is actually right above me in South Africa. So um, in Johannesburg. So I've got to deal with that um, all the time. And it's very rare for me to get really, really, really good seeing. But um, sometimes, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not. I just kind of have to deal with that was a bad night, that one. Um, let's see. Yeah, but that's, that's what they look like when they're, when they're processed. Um, and, you know, as you can see, it's a lot different on the, on that live view. So, so the, the last question I'm going to ask you, and then I'll, we, we can turn it up open to the group is, can you talk about what happened, how you were, you were able to contribute to science with the, the Juno project? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've, Oops, I'm messing up my view here. I, um, I've always done quite a bit of planetary imaging, but I've only recently this year gotten really serious about it um, for no reason other than um, a friend of mine in, in my local astronomy club here um, in Johannesburg, his name is Clyde Foster, and um, he has been doing really, really good work with high resolution planetary imaging. And he's worked with um, the NASA JPL folks um, with the Juno project, the Juno mission, um, quite a bit, just showing his, his images to them and making sure that they get good data. Because the thing is, the planetary scientists, um, especially with like Juno mission and, and other things, they don't, we don't constantly look at the planets. So they actually depend on amateurs like myself and, and Clyde um, and um, Christopher Go and Damien Peach and, you know, all the, all the big, pro, you know, the pro-am uh, imagers out there, they depend on our images to keep tabs on, on the planets. And um, so what, what we do right around near, near the flybys of the Juno, the perigoves of um, the Juno mission, the planetary scientists at JPL, they get really interested in the amateur images and they actually tell us, you know, okay, this, there's certain areas they'll say like, you know, the, the, the Juno spacecraft is going to fly along this, along this path. We want as many high resolution images on that path as we can so we can see if there's anything we, we should focus on. Um, what happened recently on the Paradrove 27, the one that happened a few weeks ago now, was um, Clyde and I got really into, you know, prepping for the Juno, the Juno mission, the Juno Paradrove. And, um, and we found a new feature. Well, Clyde found a new feature. He, he images in methane as well. And there was a very bright spot near the great red spot. And he, what he did was he saw this new feature um, and we both uploaded our images. Uh, mine was in infrared and his was in methane. And the guys at, at, at um, I believe it was a university in Spain actually saw his image and then went back and compared it to one of mine that was about 10 hours prior to his and verified that this new spot, and it's actually called Clyde's spot, nice. um, <laughs> which is cool. Um, and I mean, my, all my contribution was, was I uploaded an image and they used it to say like, well, yes, it was wasn't. not in Corey's, but right. it was in Clyde's. They should call uh, it not Corey's spot. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm still new to this, this, um, you know, uh, serious pro-am high resolution planetary game. Um, I, I've been doing it for a while, but, but only now have I really gotten really serious about, you know, making sure that I um, process my images pretty quick and try and get them up within a day or two of, of my imaging so that it's useful. Um, the sooner you can get it up, the better. But anyway, that was two days before the Juno mission. And they, we saw this new spot and they got all excited about it. And it was this bright methane outburst. And it's actually a beautiful structure. If you look at the stuff that um, has been put out there with the Perigo of 27. Um, with that spot. And they actually changed the camera that they were going to use um, on the Juno cam flyby. They switched to methane. They weren't originally going to shoot in methane. 
and they decided, well, we need to do this because there's this new spot. Um, and they did that. They, I believe they altered, slightly altered the course of it so that they could make sure that it would fly over that area. So it was really cool um, for me to, you know, contribute in the smallest way, you know, even if it was just, you know, patting Clyde on the back saying like, yeah, let's get this thing. Cause we were really monitoring it hard and, and getting no sleep for, for quite a while. And literally, I mean, nobody pays us to do this thing as, as you all know, it's like, this is just for the love of, of the cosmos and, and what we do, we get excited about staying up all night and not getting any sleep. And uh, now that I can actually do something meaningful for science, it makes it even better, which I think it's just part of the progression. So yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah, so that's what I did for that. I just posted a picture of Clyde Spot um, in the chat. It's off the Facebook post, so I can try to find a different version of people in on Facebook. So at this point, I just wanted to open it up for questions. We have 50 participants, and I'm sure somebody has a question because somebody always does. Yeah, ask me anything you want. Um, Hi, can I ask a question? Yes, yes you may. Okay, uh, just out of curiosity, are you in Johannesburg uh, now as part of this project in order to, to monitor the southern skies, or is that um, is it just kind of where you ended up due to work? Uh, no, not at all. I'm actually not here for work. I'm not here for anything, but uh, my wife is actually South African, so okay. <laughs> I moved. Oh, I, I moved. I moved here six years ago um, to get married. <laughs> okay, so this is fine. All right. Okay. All right. Just uh bit of curiosity. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Ask me, you can ask me anything. It's cool. What is uh, the, yeah. uh, what is the light pollution like in uh, Johannesburg? It's rough. Uh, it's bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, the good thing is um, only about half the street lights here work at any given time. So, <laughs> that, <laughs> and I'm not even joking. That's actually the, the truth. Um, we, we have a lot of actual pollution um, as well. So during the, the beginning of our lockdown um, at the end of March, after about, five days, it was beautiful because you could see so many more stars than normal, literally just because of uh, the lack of pollution because people weren't driving as much. Um, it, was, it was quite nice. Um, and it's, it's already almost back to, you know, those polluted levels now. But uh, the light pollution, I would say we're at around Bortle 7, maybe 8, depending. Um, if I look really, really, really hard on a super clear night, I can sometimes see a bit a bit of a brightness around the core of the Milky Way. Like right now it's at Zenith. So I can, you know, look up and often see that core, but um, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. So I, that's, that's one of the reasons I do a lot of planetary imaging now is because it's one of the things that I can do on a daily basis and not get frustrated by light pollution. So. Does, uh, does Starlink really affect your photography? Um, it doesn't the planetary at all. Um, since the Starlink stuff has really launched a lot, I have not been out to the deserts, um, into dark skies to actually do any, any shooting. Um, one of the other things that I do a lot of is, is just the wide field Milky Way work just with a camera and a, and a tripod. Um, and I'm not looking forward to all those new satellites because that is going to affect that, um, guaranteed i can it, it it affected it six years ago um it wasn't starlink back then it was other satellites but even when i go out in you know the middle of the desert in in, in um, southern africa you know you get satellites so i'm not looking forward to thousands of um thousands of new ones it, it's it's going to be interesting the first time i go out and do that i want to see i want to see what it looks like um before i you know make any strong opinion statements um about that stuff but um mm -hmm. Let's just say I'm not looking forward to more space junk out there. <laughs> so you said something about somebody imaging in methane. Yes. What, what kind of a filter is? Um, it's, it's, it's a methane fit filter. It's also referred to as a CH4 filter. I've actually got one on order right now and it, I was hoping it would be here by now, but it's not, it's stuck on the, on the plane, I believe. Um, but um, Methane filter is is kind of farther in the infrared spectrum. I don't remember the actual frequency of it, but it's kind of like imaging narrowband for planets. Um, and the Jupiter images in methane, it's really low resolution usually because you have to do um, two by two binning. Um, I'm not sh sorry, I'm not sure about everybody's knowledge of astrophotography, but binning is basically where you take 
um, uh, instead of using one pixel, you'd use a f a four, four pixels at once to, you, to make it into one. So you basically effectively have your resolution with a two by two um, binning procedure, but you double your, your light um, gathering power. And because methane, the f methane filter is, is so far in the infrared, it's actually quite a bit dimmer and it's only 20, my filter and specifically the one I ordered is gonna be 20 nanometers wide. So it's not a lot of light is gonna be let in. But what that does is that, that methane, it shows the structures in the, um, the higher up in Jupiter's atmosphere, which is interesting. And that's where the methane ends up apparently. I, I don't know enough I put an example in the chat. Oh, okay, cool. Thank example, you, Stu. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's what the methane filter is. And it, that is the most, it's the ugliest. It's not pretty, but it's the most scientifically exciting. Um, that's what all the, the planetary scientists like to look at mostly. Um, they like it all, but methane is the one that really um, interests them at the moment. So. Any other um, you guys can... Yeah, you can ask any questions about the, the actually the imaging stuff, um, software-wise or hardware. I use a, a ZWO a, ASI uh, 290 monochrome camera. Um, and what's the frame rate on that? Uh, it can go up to about 180 frames per second. Mm -hmm. um, I shoot, when I'm shooting Jupiter RGB, so red, green, blue, I shoot at about 75 frames per second at the moment. Um, which is a 13 millisecond exposure time. Um, and if uh, there's probably people in here that haven't in, in the, in the room that haven't um, done any planetary imaging, um, it's basically, you just do video capture. Mm -hmm. So basically what capture, you're doing right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this is just a view. I'm actually not capturing, but I will, I'll start one just so you can kind of watch. Um, I'm going to have it automatically do the red, green and blue filters for me for 60 seconds each. Um, and the telescope is then going to automatically change filters. So you'll see that move around um, and then it'll start the, the acquisition. So what I will do is I'll capture 60 seconds of each color, um, red, green, and blue, and then um, it'll capture, see up here, you can see this, this is the frame rate. Right. This you is see, how many you notice you've already captured 400 megabytes in just in that yeah, yeah, it's already, yeah, it's 500. Yeah, this is the current file size of what I'm capturing. So you, uh, you, how big is your hard drive? Uh, it's actually not that big because it's an SSD. It's only, um, I, I can only capture about 150 gigabytes um, max um, without, without emptying the drive. But, so you can see this yellow box around, around the planet. This is the only part of the entire camera sensor that's actually being saved. Um, and that's just basically to save hard drive space because all I really care about is the planet. I had it a little bit wider because I was going to get IO in there, but um, I'm done with that now. Um, so usually I'll have it just in a nice square box right around the planet. And um, up here is the resolution. It's only capturing about 796 by 552 pixels right now. Um, so that'll make that file size quite a bit smaller. If I were to capture the entire frame, so for example, my, when I do lunar imaging, I'll capture the whole frame and it's a, it's a 1080p sensor. Um, if I capture it 180 frames per second or even 150, 120, whatever it is, my lunar captures at the full frame are about 20 gigabytes per, per um, video capture. So I can't even do that many. Uh, <laughs> so I've got to kind of be careful of, of what I pick and choose to image. Um, and delete the bad stuff or dump it off the hard drive as quick, quickly as I can. So, um, and that goes same thing with solar, white light solar. Ooh, getting some movement here. Um, and you're using sharp cap to uh, capture. Right? No, I am yeah. using a, a program called fire. Capture. Oh, fire capture. Uh, Sorry. That's what I meant. Yes. Okay. So if anybody wants to get into this, if you've got an ASI, like a Z CWO camera, if you've got a QHY planetary camera, um, it, it, it also will, I think some webcams will work. Um, fire capture is the, by and large, the best, um, software and, package you can and use. And how much does it cost? It is free. There you go. Um, <laughs> so yeah. what I wanted, what it, it, that's not why it's the best though. It is, it's, it's, I mean, Damien Peach uses it. Michael Go 
or sorry, Christopher Go uses it. Um, Michael Go is another friend of mine. <laughs> um, uh, all the, you know, all the best planetary imagers in the world use this software. Um, and it's still actively being, being, uh, developed by a guy named Torsten Edelman. Um, I think he's in Germany and, um, it's well supported. It, it runs on multiple platforms. It's best on windows, to be honest, just because the camera, uh, the camera drivers don't work as well. Yeah. But as we can see, you probably saw a green go by and now we're on blue. So it'll, it'll change. It'll change this up here. It's automatically so, done this. We, we had a, we had a question in the chat and somebody wants, cause I know you said it, but you probably missed it. Can you just uh, real quickly tell what your telescope is? Um, yep. and what your focal length is not a problem. So this is the telescope. It's a, t it's a 12 inch Ritchie Cretien telescope. I'm running it now at um, F20, uh, 6,000, right around 6,000 millimeters of focal length. Um, and yeah, it's got, so I've got, let's see, can you see the mouse pointer? I'm not sure if you can. Yeah, probably. we can. Okay, cool. So this is the camera right here. This little tiny thing right here is the camera. Um, this is the filter wheel there. And I've got five filters in there. I've got red, green, blue, luminance, and infrared. Um, and then this is the, this is a, is a 2.5 X, um, Barlow, um, power mate Barlow there. This is my motorized focuser attached to the other, other side of the Crayford focuser there. Um, these rings are just, they're called imaging rings and they just push that, push that out so that I can actually attain focus with the, with the camera. And then the optical tube is there. So it's got a 12 inch mirror back here. There's no corrector plate on the front on a Richie Cretien design. So it's kind of like, um, it's, it, you could think of it as a Dobsonian style um, or just an SCT without the corrector plate on the front. So I don't ever have to worry about dew, which is very nice. Um, usually here in Johannesburg, we don't have dew issues anyway, but um, it does happen occasionally. Um, and it's on a Celestron CGEM DX mount and the whole thing is overloaded. Um, it's too heavy, so I can't really do any deep sky imaging or much deep sky imaging with it. It just doesn't track well enough for that, but tracks good enough for planets. And that's what I'm concerned about at the moment. So um, that's the telescope that I'm using. Steve, how are we on time? Do we have time for more questions? I really don't. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So cool. um, Corey, I just wanted to thank you for, for, uh, for, uh, for sharing your images. I thought that having you, do uh, uh, you do a live image would be much better than me doing a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad it worked out and uh, my pleasure and check it out. It's called the telescope time machine live stream on YouTube. Um, if you go to photographing space.com, the website, there's actually a link on the front page to the live stream. Um, and then it's got all the old episodes, episodes, if you want to call them that um, on there, if you want to check anything out or, or tune in ever and pop in. It's a, it's basically a constant question and answer session all right. the time. I just, so. when, when, when I'm, when he does it and I'm on, when he's on, uh, if I see it, I'll pop onto YouTube and I'll just, I'll just harass him on YouTube. With yeah. Tom. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. So much, Gary. Thank you. Thank you both. And with that, I'd like to take a, about a five minute break. And we will get started again in five minutes. Thank you. Looks like we've still got somebody's shared screen up. Yeah, it says Marisa's screen.
Did everybody get kicked off? No, I don't think anybody got kicked off, did they? I don't know, Jack seemed to have. Looks like he stopped sharing his video, maybe. I don't know what he did. Is Dick Flask on? Not hearing. Dick is on. Why don't we go ahead and get started with our main speaker? It is my pleasure to introduce the main speaker, Dr. Petka Patel, University of California, Berkeley. Her speech tonight is about satellite galaxies and the local group. Dr. Patel is a Miller Fellow in the Department of Astronomy at UC Berkeley, who received her BA in Physics from NYU in 2014 and her PhD in Astronomy and Astrophysics from the University of Arizona in 2019. 
at U of A Stewart's Observatory, she worked to analyze high resolution cosmo cosmological simulations such as Lestrius to help us understand the dynamic history of the local group. At University of California, Berkeley, she is continuing her work on understanding the dynamics of satellite galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way and Andromeda. She is actively engaged with the public in a variety of ways in her career so far, including past involvement with Fuller's Nature Project Astro, the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, and Teen Astronomy Cafe. Dr. Patel. Hello, thanks. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. yes. Okay. Let's see if I can get this up. All right. Do you see those slides? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for having me tonight. Um, I'm glad I could fill in for Dan, who's actually my mentor here at UC Berkeley um, and whose wife recently had a baby. So glad I was able to fill in for him. Hopefully I'll tell you about some uh, exciting things that uh, he would have also probably mentioned from his own perspective. Um, so uh, as mentioned, I'll be talking about um, satellite galaxies in the local group. Uh, much of what I'll tell you today um, includes projects that I've worked on throughout the last five or six years, um, as well as ongoing projects that myself and my collaborators are working on. Um, since we were talking, I, I called in when Corey was talking about uh, his, his uh, observations in photography. So I'll disclaim that I am not an astronomer who stays up all night and takes pictures using telescopes. Um, I'm actually trained to be a theorist, which means mostly I'm on my computer analyzing simulation data um, and running models. So that's what I'll be telling you about today. Um, let's see if this will advance. Do, 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 do. All right. Um, so in this talk, I hope to walk you through these two questions. Um, what are satellite galaxies and why are they important? And how do astronomers use observations and simulations to study satellite galaxies? Um, so first I'll give you a little bit of history about this field and discuss topics including dark matter, the Milky Way, the Andromeda galaxy. Um, and at the end of the talk, I'll also go into modern observational and computational techniques that astronomers like me um, are using in our day-to-day -day research. So to start, I just want to define a few of the key terms um, that were in the title of my talk, just in case you're not all familiar with them. So before I jump into uh, what a satellite galaxy is, I first just want to spend a bit of time talking about galaxies in general. Um, so typically when we hear the word galaxy, we think of images like the one in the background here, um, but this is not always the case. And in fact, even our modern definition of a galaxy is still changing today. So when you think of the word galaxy, you probably think about images like this or this or these, anything along these lines. Um, but there's also objects in the universe that look like this and they're not galaxies, but what, what are the characteristics of these objects that actually allow us to call one a galaxy but not the other? Um, so it was actually just about 100 years ago uh, this year that there was something called the Great Debate. Um, where two academics argued against one another about whether our own Milky Way was the entirety of the universe that they knew about at that time, or if the Mil Milky Way was just another one of these galaxies or what they referred to then as spiral nebulae amongst the sea of many. So even now our definition is still changing. Um, and what we typically follow these days is this definition, which was published in a paper that was written um, not very long ago in 2012. And the definition is that a galaxy is a gravitationally bound collection of stars whose properties cannot be explained by a combination of baryons and Newton's laws of gravity. There's quite a bit in that statement, so let me unpack a little bit. So by baryons, we're talking about subatomic particles like protons and neutrons. And by Newton's laws of gravity, we're talking about um, things you might have learned in a high school physics class if you took one, like force equals mass times acceleration, massive bodies feel equal and opposite forces, those types of basic physics laws. Um, now what this means in the context of the images that I just showed you and in how we, we proceed in modern astronomy is that this definition means that a cluster of stars can only be a, a galaxy if they also have some additional mass. And what we typically think that mass comes in is the form of dark matter, which I'll talk about a little bit more in just, uh, in just a few slides. 
So this is kind of our modern definition of galaxy. Um, one of the reasons I like to bring this up during these talks is not only to illuminate that this definition is changing, as I've mentioned, um, but also that as we have more advanced technology and are observing more and more unique objects out in the night sky, um, we really are learning, learning quite so much more about the faintest stellar systems in the universe. And so we need to continuously sort of update this definition. Kind of similar to how uh, Pluto was demoted from being a planet that was because there were many objects found out in the outer solar system that were somewhat like Pluto. And so therefore there, were, there was a bit more of a stringent definition applied to what, what planets are considered today. Okay, so that's all I wanna say about the definition of a galaxy. So let's move on to satellite galaxies. Um, so just like uh, the moon's orbit around planets, um, Corey was also talking about some of those earlier, satellite galaxies are galaxies that orbit around other galaxies. Um, typically, in this case, uh, the satellites are orbiting around a much uh, larger or more massive galaxy, and that's the context in which I'll operate today. So I won't necessarily be talking about two galaxies that are of equal mass orbiting around each other, but I'll really be talking about uh, a, a smaller, less massive galaxy orbiting around a larger, more massive galaxy, and that's the satellite definition I'll talk about. So moving on to the local group, um, you may be familiar with this term already if you've heard talks about our Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy, but I quickly like to show this schematic just to get everyone on the same page. So the local group consists of our own Milky Way Galaxy, which you're seeing down in the bottom right here. This is just, of course, an artist's depiction. Um, and you can also see all of these balls of light, which are supposed to represent many of the satellite galaxies that we know are currently orbiting around our Milky Way. This is not all of the satellites that we know of orbiting around the Milky Way to date, um, and I'll talk more about that. But the local group also consists of the Andromeda Galaxy, and similarly, the Andromeda Galaxy also has a population of satellite galaxies orbiting around it. Um, lastly, the local group also includes a few isolated dwarf galaxy members. Some of them are pictured down here in the bottom left. Um, these don't really appear to be gravitationally bound either to the Andromeda Galaxy or to the Milky Way Galaxy. Um, but we do consider them to be members of the local group, typically because the local group is defined um, by this sort of size, where the local group's um, radius is approximately a megaparsec, or about 3 million light years across. Um, and just for reference, the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies are separated by about 2.5 million light years, um, or almost nearly a megaparsec, if you're familiar with those terms. Um, most of the satellite galaxies that are orbiting around both the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy are dwarf galaxies. Um, dwarf galaxies have masses that are about 100 all the way up to a billion times the mass of the Sun. And in size, they're typically about 10 to 100 times smaller than the physical size of the Milky Way's extent. Um, however, this graphic, as I mentioned, does not show all of the satellite galaxies that we currently know of orbiting around our own Milky Way. So I like to show this graph because I think it really um, gets the point across that this field is, is a really exciting one to be in right now because we're learning so much more about our own galactic neighborhood. Um, so what this figure is showing you is a timeline on the bottom. It goes back to the year 1700 and counts up to today on the right, bottom right. And the vertical axis is showing the total number of satellites as a function of their discovery time. So on the bottom left here, I've labeled the Magellanic Clouds, um, which were mentioned in my introduction. So these are the large and small Magellanic Clouds, which are pictured here. Um, they are two satellite galaxies that orbit around the Milky Way, and they're actually the two most massive and some of the most nearest uh, gal satellite galaxies orbiting around our Milky Way. Um, and they're visible in the skies of the Southern Hemisphere if you're uh, lucky enough to be in a dark place. So if we go back to this timeline, um, the Magellanic Clouds have actually been known to humanity for not just back to the year 1700, but for many, many hundreds of years before that. They actually appear in ancient texts from people all across the world in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but I just cut off the timeline uh, at the year 1700 just for ease of showing the representation of satellites um, that were discovered more recently. Um, so if we move down the timeline closer to the 1900s and the 1950s, we start to see this uptake here um, around 1950. And that's where additional satellite galaxies uh, started to be discovered. Many of the first uh, 10 or 12 of these satellites were discovered in photographic plates. Um, but moving towards the year 2000 and the beginning of the millennium, uh, there were um, some advances in technology that really led to a huge number of discoveries in the, in the number of satellite galaxies we now know of. 
So the first um, survey that contributed the discovery of many of these satellites is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, if you're not familiar with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, it was the first digital survey by name. Um, and it was taken with a telescope at Apache Point in New Mexico. Um, and what's uh, really wonderful about these digital surveys is that they're, of course, digital and don't necessarily require changing out plates um, that photons are collected onto. Uh, but they're um, more uh, robotic telescopes in a sense, they still do require some human interaction to change out some of the, some of the equipment throughout the night. Um, but they scan the sky over very large swaths and they do this many, many times so that you can collect really deep images in the same part of the sky over and over again. Um, so thanks to, to surveys like um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, many more of these faint dwarf galaxies started to be found because there were uh, uniform surveys across many large patches of the sky. So SDSS, as we like to call it, um, contributed many of these discoveries, um, bringing us up to about 30 known satellite galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way as of approximately the year 2010. Um, and in just the last decade, there's also been a second huge increase in discoveries of satellite galaxies. And many of those satellites were discovered in the Dark Energy Survey, which is also a digital survey, similarly um, looks at large swaths of the southern sky th this time rather than the northern sky. Um, but similar to uh, the SDSS survey, the Dark Energy Survey is um, looking even deeper into the universe and so identifying even fainter um, stellar systems that, that we are uh, confirming are actually satellite galaxies. Um, and I like to show this image because it sort of traces out when you're looking up at the sky uh, a part of the footprint of the Dark Energy Survey which is very closely clustered nearby the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. So each of the red points that are highlighted inside of the red region um, is a candidate satellite galaxy that was discovered in this survey area, um, and some of which uh, we're now working on and think that they might be associated with the Magellanic Clouds themselves in that they could even be satellites of the Magellanic Clouds. Um, so I'll come back to this idea at the end of my talk. Um, so there's been, a, there's been a really big increase in the number of satellites we found. We now know of about, uh, I think it's 55 or so satellite galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way. Um, so like I said, it's been a, a really exciting time to work in this field because a lot of these latter discoveries were made while I was in graduate school. So now that we know what satellite galaxies are, um, hopefully I'll illuminate to you why are these satellite galaxies important. So first, uh, the faintest satellite galaxies, many of the most recently discovered ones that are only maybe um, about 100 times the mass of the sun or less, these are often referred to as ultra-faint dwarf galaxies because they are the faintest of the dwarf galaxies. Um, and these galaxies often uh, appear to have formed their stars very early in the universe, and they show evidence of being some of the earliest formed galaxies, and so we think of them as windows into the early universe. So I like this image here because it's showing what we might be able to see with the James Webb Space Telescope, which is supposed to launch next year, if all goes well, after many delays. Um, and what this graphic is showing is uh, this point here is where many of these ultra-faint galaxies we think formed in the timeline of the universe, where the right side showing the Big Bang and the left side of the image is showing um, the present, present uh, universe that we live in. Um, so these uh, ultra-faint dwarfs are, are really the, the relics of this era of the early universe. Um, and so we can use them to study these um, very distant uh, points in time that we don't necessarily have the, the technology to study um, just yet. Uh, so that's the first reason why these satellite galaxies are important, but I'm actually not gonna talk any further about this aspect of satellite galaxies today. Um, this is a very active field of research as well, um, and I'm sure that you could also have somebody else come in and give an hour long talk on all of the great things about uh, these ultra faint dwarf galaxies and why they're so exciting in studying the early universe. Okay, so the next two reasons I'll give you are uh, reasons that are a bit more close to home for me and why I use satellite galaxies as tools in my own research. Um, so the second one is that satellite galaxies are the building blocks of galaxies. So in the same way that plants need water to grow, these satellite galaxies really contribute to the growth of the host galaxies that they're orbiting around. So going back to this image that I showed quickly on my title slide, this is an artist's illustration of uh, a satellite galaxy orbiting around a central spiral galaxy, perhaps like our own Milky Way. Um, and over time, what you're seeing is that this satellite 
is losing many of its stars and it's forming the stellar stream, which are the stars that are trailing in front and behind the main body of that satellite. And eventually what we think happens is that these satellites funnel into the central most part of the host galaxy and eventually merge into that host galaxy. So this is the process by we, which we think galaxies, one of the processes by which we think galaxies evolve and grow over time is by essentially eating up their small satellite neighbors. Um, now, when we look out into the universe with the most powerful telescopes in the world, we can see this process in action, this merging of two galaxies into one. Um, so you, here I'm showing some images that were taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, and you're looking at pairs of galaxies that are at various stages of the merging process, um, where at the top left is showing you galaxies that are somewhat close to each other in proximity, but not necessarily feeling a strong gravitational pull from each other. And as you move down towards the bottom right, you're seeing the, that two galaxies have merged into each other and almost look indistinguishable in that they've now become one galaxy. Um, one thing to point out in these images is that all of these are showing the merging process of roughly equal mass galaxies. And as I mentioned, the satellites I'm concerned with are the satellites that are about 10% the mass of their host galaxy or less. So I'd like to show you a, li a little bit more of an accurate depiction of what happens when satellite galaxies merge into their host galaxies. And in particular, I'll show you um, a movie that will, uh, where we'll watch the satellite galaxies around a Milky Way-like galaxy um, falling into that Milky Way analog um, and disrupting over time and eventually becoming a part of that central host galaxy. So this animation um, is from simulated data um, it's from a suite of simulations called the Latte simulations. Um, and so I'll let this start. If you're familiar with Redshift, we'll start at Redshift 1, which is about 8 billion years ago, and it'll go forward in time, ending with today. So in the center here, you're seeing a um, Milky Way-like galaxy, roughly. Uh, it's, uh, its estimated mass is roughly the mass of the Milky Way. And though it doesn't quite look like it in this rendering, it is a spiral galaxy as well. Okay, so you'll see clusters of stars and satellite galaxies falling towards the central image. You'll see some bigger satellites fall in. Sometimes they fly by once, they fly by twice. Some of them fall directly into the center and are absorbed like this last more massive one. So this is the general process by which I say that satellite galaxies fuel the growth of the um, host galaxies that they orbit around. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, Let's see if that goes forward. Okay. And the third reason I'll tell you about today in terms of why satellite galaxies are important is that they help us learn about their host galaxies overall. And not only do they help us learn about their hosts, but the, the relics that they leave behind um, while they're going through this process of disruption are also very informative in learning about the host galaxies. So as I mentioned, this image is showing you a stellar stream, which is the remnant of this disrupting satellite galaxy whose main body you can see on the bottom left here. Um, and these ribbons of stars are what we refer to as stellar streams. These are streams of stars that we have been able to observe. Many of the first streams were discovered again in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and many additional ones have been found since then. I think we're now up to having um, observations of a few dozen of these stellar streams um, of all, all various morphologies and uh, with a diversity of properties. Um, so this is a, the third reason why satellite galaxies are important, um, is that they help us learn something about what it is that they're actually orbiting around, because they're being influenced by the gravitational pull of that central host galaxy, and therefore the orbits of these satellite galaxies themselves encode some information about that central host galaxy. So to understand that a little bit further and to unpack that, I just want to give a, a brief anatomy of our own galaxy. Um, again, this is another artist's depiction based on some real data. But if we look at the main components of the Milky Way, on the left, you're seeing a uh, what we call face-on image, or as if you were looking at a galaxy like the Milky Way from above. Um, and there's a little pointer showing you where we are, where the sun's location is. And on the right, you're seeing a similar image, but from the side view. And so here you can easily see, again, the location of the sun is, is partway into the disk of the galaxy. There's a very bright bulge of stars or a nucleus of stars in the center. There's a galactic disk here. Um, there's also some labels of globular clusters and a stellar halo. I won't talk about those two aspects of galaxies today. Um, but there's one thing that's not shown in these images, and that is the dark matter halo that we think galaxies live inside of. So here again, I'm showing another image, which is actually showing you real uh, simulated data in the background in the, in the blue um, color. 
And again, you see a, a spiral like galaxy in the center, something that may look like our Milky Way. And then here I've just very uh, roughly drawn on a dark matter halo. This is absolutely not to scale relative to the size of the central galactic disk um, where the main body of the stars are. Um, and these dark matter halos generally for a, for a galaxy like the Milky Way, we think are about 20 times larger in physical extent than the disk of the host galaxy. Um, and the dark matter is where we actually think a majority of a galaxy's mass resides as well. So dark matter for a galaxy like the Milky Way, it probably encompasses about 85% of what we consider the total mass of the Milky Way to be. Um, so this is the, the other major component that satellite galaxies help us learn about. Um, just to give you a bit of uh, historical background, you might be wondering, well, how, how, do you, how do we know that there is dark matter in the universe and, and who came up with this? Why, why is this a thing that we believe so strongly today? Um, so much of this work was pioneered by Vera Rubin. Um, she looked at the rotation curves of many spiral galaxies out in the universe. Um, and she found uh, what's plotted in the bottom left here in a very basic sense. So this graph is showing, if you look at a galaxy like the one in the background here, and you move away from the center of that galaxy towards the fainter regions, you would naively expect that the speed of the stars that are rotating as you move from the center to the, to the outskirts would go up and then sharply decline which is what's shown in this yellow curve here, the expected um, rotation curve or rotation speed of stars in that galaxy. Um, however, what was actually observed is what's shown in the green curve, which is that at the center, you see a very rapid increase in the speed of the stars as you move towards the outskirts of the galaxies. And then these, the speed actually flattens out. So rather than decreasing because we think there might be less mass in the outskirts of the galaxies where the light starts to become more dim, um, Vera Rubin found that actually these rotation curves, one after another after another, continued to look like they were flat as you went to the more dimmer outskirt regions of these galaxies. So you can think of this as similar to thinking about either, you know, a ceiling fan or a pinwheel. The points on the edge of the wheel you would think move slower than the points to, you know, closer to the center of the wheel. That's not what we think is happening with these spiral galaxies, and so this was one reason that provided evidence that there must be some invisible massive matter in the outskirts of galaxies, really throughout, throughout the whole galaxy, not just in the outskirts, um, but a lot of it is concentrated perhaps in the outskirts. That explains this discrepancy between the basic laws of physics and our expectations and what was actually being observed when we looked out at galaxies and measured their properties. Um, so going back to the role of satellites and shedding light on their host galaxies' properties, um, I'm going to show a quick animation that's actually from some uh, work that I finished up earlier this year. And what you'll see when I start to play this movie is um, the orbits of satellite galaxies, uh, real satellite galaxies, uh, orbiting around the Milky Way. And they'll be playing for over the time scale of the last three billion years. Um, so what you'll, you see in the center here is a very crude depiction of our own Milky Way with a bulge and a disk. And in this uh, lighter yellow sphere, I've just sort of painted on a very, uh, again, crude version of a dark matter halo. We don't actually know whether this is a spherical halo or if it has some other type of shape to it, um, but I just put it on there for, for the context of where these satellites might help illuminate something. So I'll play this video. It's going to start backwards in time again and move forward to today. So these white points all are showing you uh, the current positions of satellite galaxies. Uh, sorry, the positions of the satellite galaxies three and a half billion years ago, and then you'll start to trace out um, some orbits moving towards today. So I'll play that. And you'll see right off the bat that these orbits have many different um, shapes and lengths. And so by looking at these, this whole ensemble of orbits that we can model um, from real observational data, we start to sort of unveil properties of this dark matter halo that we can't directly observe. So by the gravitational interaction of these satellite galaxies with the mass that is perhaps in the outskirts of the Milky Way's um, halo, we can start to use these orbits to uncover some of that. So as I mentioned, some of these orbits look a bit more circular. Some of them look as if the satellite is only entering the Milky Way's gravitational pull for the very first time. Um, many of these are, you know, irregular shapes. They're not as ordered like we see in terms of um, the orbits of planets in our solar system, for example. Um, there's a bit more uh, physics involved here in the, in the aspects of what, what is gravitationally pulling on what. Um, and also, of course, the time scales are vastly different than um, the orbits of, of planets and moons in our own solar system as well. 
Um, so what, what these orbits can help us figure out is potentially how much mass is in that dark matter halo, since again, we can't observe it directly. So by using these orbits to sort of trace out that mass that we can't see, we might be able to, to nail down really what that mass um, is for the total mass of the Milky Way. We have a rough idea, but we don't have a super precise idea of this. Um, and again, as I mentioned, in terms of shape, we don't actually know if this dark matter halo is a nice spherical um, halo. It could be more like a pancake shape. It could be more like a football shape. It could be an irregular shape entirely that's really not smooth. It could be more lumpy. Um, so again, this is another active area of research, um, and these satellite galaxies are helping us sort of pick apart um, what the sort of shape and mass and other properties of these dark matter halos are, especially around our own Milky Way galaxy where we have a lot of this data available to us. Um, and as I quickly mentioned, these orbital time scales are of course a few billion years. Uh, so while we can model these orbits, we can't actually trace them in real time because of course they're on uh, much longer time scales than, than our time span on the Earth. Um, Okay, so for the next portion of my talk, I want to actually go into um, what are the tools that we use to study these satellite galaxies, how are some of the main observations taken, um, and what are the simulations that we use also to study these satellite galaxies as well. So first I'll start with the observations. Um, I'm showing a nice picture of the Hubble Space Telescope in the background here. Um, so to start, uh, we need to measure the motions of the stars in these galaxies to help us then figure out uh, what is the full orbital trajectory like I showed you in that animation. So we need sort of a starting point to have a general idea of how satellite galaxies are moving relative to the Milky Way. And then once we have that information, we can plug it into our models and really trace out where those satellites might have spent their time over the last three or five or six billion years. Um, so the observations needed to model these types of orbits that I'm showing you are what we refer to as proper motion. So I'll, I'll walk you through this diagram, there's, a, there's quite a few things going on. Um, but if you were an observer here on Earth and you were looking out at some stars that are in, let's say, the same galaxy, um, and let's, let's say you already know the distance to that star um, by taking some observations and uh, using some stellar evolution models that tell you the star is probably you know, this age and so we can figure out what its brightness is relative to the distance to the Earth. Um, so if we know the distance, and we might also have measured a spectra for the stars, a spectrum for the stars, in which case we also know maybe the velocity that that star is moving towards and away from us from the Doppler shift. Um, we can then go out and measure or take a picture of that star at some later time. So that's what I'm showing the second star. There's a shift in the position of that star across the sky. And that is what we call the proper motion. So it's essentially the angle that a star moves across the sky as a function of time. So when you're looking at, when you're using telescopes to measure this, you would essentially need a set of images at one point in time, and then you'd have to go back to that same set of stars some amount of time later, depending on how far those stars are from you, um, and measure what is the difference in the position of those stars, and that's the proper motion. And the benefit of having this proper motion is that, again, from measuring the spectrum of these stars, we can get the motion of those stars towards and away from us, but this proper motion is what gives us the additional two-dimensional motion across the plane of the sky. So that in combination then gives us a full three-dimensional motion for how those stars in a particular galaxy are moving relative to our own vantage point. Um, so I'm going to show another animation that will, will give you a real example of how, how this is done. Uh, this video will show you how the proper motion of the Andromeda galaxy was taken um, in 2012, also using the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and I want to give you a preview of what you'll see so that you pay attention to a couple of important points in here. So there's this blue field that we'll zoom into. Uh, while it may not look like it, this field does contain stars that are a part of this Andromeda galaxy. I know this is the main body and this is where most of the light is. Um, but there are stars uh, that are less concentrated, even out uh, to this distance relative to the main body. So we'll zoom into that field. You'll see many stars as well as background galaxies that are very much more distant than the stars. And you, it'll play as a function of time. So just take a look, the time counter will be in the bottom right. So just take a look at how that time counter is moving. Um, and then hopefully you'll uh, be, a, be a bit surprised as to what you see. All right, so we'll zoom into that field of stars. The brighter white points are the stars that are actually in the Andromeda galaxy, and you'll see the more fixed stationary points in the background are more distant stars or distant background galaxies. So you essentially see these stars drifting across the sky. Now, if you paid attention to the time in the bottom right, we started in the year 
2012. I'll play this one more time. Let's see if it'll go. All right. So it'll start in the year 2012. Again, you see the stars drifting across the sky. The brightest white points are actually stars within Andromeda. And at the end of the movie, we count all the way up to the year 26,000 something. So you might be wondering, well, why, why, why does it go so fast? Um, and that's because these motions, at least at the distance of the Andromeda galaxy, which is roughly a megaparsec away from the Milky Way, these motions are so small um, that in order to actually see this in a video like the one I'm showing you, we have to highly exaggerate the timeline by which these stars are moving. So these are incredibly small motions that we're trying to capture. Um, there, if you're familiar with the technology, we're talking about hundredths of a thousandth of a pixel um, on a CCD. Um, but if you want a more real world analogy, this measurement um, at the distance of Andromeda is like watching the rate of human hair grow at the distance of the moon. So if your best friend was standing on the moon and you had no telescope on the earth and you wanted to figure out how fast their hair was growing over on the moon, this is the type of measurement that we're trying to tease out from these um, observations to get this proper motion measurement so that we can fully understand the three-dimensional motion of stars in other galaxies. Um, so I think it's, it's quite remarkable that we can do this and that um, astronomers have developed the right techniques to be able to really look through the data and figure out what is noise, what is real, what is not. Um, and so we're able to do this now, not only for the Andromeda galaxy, but also for many of these satellite galaxies, which is why I was able to show you the, the calculated orbits in this animation. These are all based on having true measured proper motions for a subset of the Milky Way satellite galaxies. And by using that three-dimensional information about where a satellite is and how it's moving relative to us, we can then actually calculate um, what we think its orbital trajectory has been. Um, all right, so that's my, that's my little section on observations. Um, and I'll move on to how we also use simulations to study um, similar topics. And then how I'll, I'll sort of piece it all together and how both the observations and simulations work um, together for us to really help us uh, gain, a, gain a better understanding of these satellite galaxies and their hosts. Um, so the simulations uh, that are most relevant to my work, um, as was mentioned in my introduction, are what we call cosmological simulations. So cosmological simulations um, essentially aim to reproduce a large portion of a mock universe in a computer. Um, so not only are we focusing, for example, on one star forming region where, our, where maybe a handful of stars are born or one solar system or even one galaxy forming and evolving over time, these cosmological simulations are the largest scale simulations that we have in the astronomy community. They take many, many people to create. They take many, many years of science to put into them. Um, and at the end of the day, what we end up with is a, a vast simulated data set that contains hundreds of thousands of galaxies of all variety of masses, of morphological types, um, but essentially a, a, a fake universe in a computer that we can compare our real universe to. And of course, the simulations are beneficial in that we can sort of fast forward and rewind the simulations to gain a better understanding of how um, things are evolving over time when we can't actually go out and observe them directly. So what you're seeing in this image, which actually does move, um, is an animated projection of the dark matter density distribution across one of these cosmological simulations. So I've given a scale of size on the bottom. So these, these simulations um, are, are aiming to reproduce 100 megaparsecs. So you could think about it as the volume that encompasses 100 of our local groups, if you want. Um, but it's really not the volume. It's just the side length. So it's, it's 100 cubed is what, we're, what they're really representing. Um, and uh, what this is often referred to is this uh, cosmic web. So if you've heard of um, the cosmic web, this is what we, we often refer to as the large scale structures in the universe. Um, and in a, in a structural sense, they are very similar to perhaps the neurons that are in your brain. They have these filamentary structures. Um, at the centers, you see some bright points. In this context, in terms of galaxy formation and evolution of the whole universe, um, at the centers of these nodes where the filaments are connecting, you see brighter, more dense pink regions. And that's where you would find the most massive galaxy clusters composed of hundreds to thousands of galaxies. Um, in some of the smaller and less bright pink regions, um, you would find galaxy groups like the local group. And so essentially anywhere where you see um, a high density, which is represented in the pinker color here, 
um, that's where you're seeing many groups of galaxies being formed. And in the darker blue regions, this, this is what we call voids. Um, and so that's where there's not really much luminous light. It's more uh, a, a void by its name in that there's not, uh, there's not galaxies forming in those regions. Um, so cosmological simulations like this one, like I said, reproduce this mock universe in a computer. Um, and we can answer a whole slew of questions, and I'll just touch on a very, very small sliver of the types of analyses that can be done with these simulations in the context of satellite galaxies. Um, so, uh, of course, like I said, there's a lot that goes into these simulations, so I like to break this down in terms of a recipe, in terms of how do we create a cosmological simulation? What are the basic things that go into it? Um, what kind of computing power does it require? And, you know, how long might it take for it to run? So, uh, to begin, you need some ingredients for your simulation. In this case, we're talking about a set of equations that describe the growth of the universe from the Big Bang to today. So this is sort of the basic principles of cosmology. Um, you need an efficient code in which to implement this model. Uh, and you also need to decide on some specifics about the particles or the spatial resolution, your simulation size. Are you aiming to reproduce just one galaxy or are you really going to try to reproduce hundreds of thousands like in the cosmological simulations I'm talking about? Then you need some cooking tools. In this case, these cosmological simulations require the fastest, most powerful computers in the world. So there's either super, supercomputers. You could think of them as thousands of desktops in one running simultaneously to run this really sophisticated um, piece of code. You also need a set of directions, of course. And so in the context of simulations and specifically these cosmological ones, um, there's a lot of physics that goes into them. And so just a few of the questions that you need to have a relative answer to for, for these simulations are, how do stars form? How do galaxies merge? How do black holes contribute to the galaxy's evolution? So when you have a basic understanding of maybe some, some of those questions, those also go into the recipe of this, uh, this type of simulation. Then of course you have to wait. So your supercomputer will run for 13.8 billion simulated years or the age of the universe. Um, of course the technology makes it such that we don't actually have to wait a real 13.8 billion years, but because we have the power of many computers harnessed together um, in one, it takes uh, much less time than billions of years. And then at the end of this, you end up with about a thousand gigabytes of simulated galaxies and their surroundings. And generally, the properties of these simulated galaxies do match those of the, the galaxies we see when we look out into the observed universe. Of course, if that wasn't the case, these simulations wouldn't be the most helpful to us. And so it does take quite a bit of um, tweaking to make sure we'll actually come out with something that is a reasonable representation of the universe as we as we think it is. Um, okay, so in the next slide, I'm going to show you again some videos of uh, the Illustra simulation, which is just one of a handful of cosmological simulations that exists, and that's actively being used by astronomers. Um, in the animation, you'll see two boxes. On the left side, you'll see the evolution of dark matter across time. Again, it'll run from the Big Bang all the way forward to today. Um, so it'll go through 13.8 billion years very quickly, in about a minute and a half maybe. Um, on the right side, you'll see it's the same simulation, but it's just showing you a different view of the simulation. The right side will be showing you um, the temperature of the gas in the simulation. So you notice many similarities between the two boxes since they are the same simulation at the end of the day. They're just being rendered so you can sort of pick apart um, the main components of them. So you'll see both similarities and differences between the two. Okay, so again, on the left side, you see the dark matter and on the right side, you see gas temperature. Starting at the Big Bang, the left box obviously has a bit more um, in it because we think the dark matter forms first and then the galaxies follow after. Um, and as I showed you in the picture of the cosmic web, you're starting to see these filaments and at the centers of these filaments, there's these bright pink regions where galaxies are starting to form. On the right side, you see a similar structure because that's the gas temperature of the same universe you're seeing on the left. We're also starting to see some explosions go off. These are supernovae, they're massive stars dying and expelling gas into their outskirts. Eventually that gas will be recycled and form new stars and contribute to the growth of new galaxies. So overall, the, the qualitative properties of both the left and the right are vaguely similar in their structures, but of course, um, the gas on the right side is much more diffuse, uh, spreading across much uh, wider space, if you'll have it. Uh, where on the left side, you've now come very close to the current universe, um, and you're seeing the, so the brightest, biggest galaxy clusters have already formed. There's uh, many big voids where there's not much growth of galaxies. Um, 
But this is essentially the simulation in a box. Um, so like I said, this, these types of simulations are some of the biggest uh, types of simulations that exist in our community. They take a whole team of people. The ones listed here are just some of the core team members. Um, and of course, it takes many different supercomputers and funding agencies and institutes to actually put these together. And so um, I imagine for, for many of the people leading these types of projects, it's a whole lifetime's worth of work. Um, so simulations like Illustrious uh, were run on about 8,000 computer cores and it took 19 million CPU hours. Um, so for fun, I like to say that it's equivalent to just one of your own laptops that you're probably looking at me on um, right now running for about 2000 years. So this is where we, where the supercomputers really come in and are, are helpful in, in creating these types of data sets. Okay, so for the rest of this, um, I'll tell you about how I use these simulations to actually go back to the question of satellite galaxies around, around galaxies like our own Milky Way. So since these cosmological simulations reproduce hundreds of thousands of galaxies um, with a diversity of properties, what I do is I look into these simulations um, at, the, at the representation that ends up at uh, the time equivalent to today, so after the 13.8 billion years have evolved in the simulation. And I look for galaxies that are roughly analogous to the Milky Way. And the way I choose those is by um, looking at the masses of those galaxies. So um, generally, I would like them to be spiral galaxies. Uh, and I also would like them to be about a trillion times the mass of the sun, which is our rough estimate for what we think the mass of the Milky Way is. So here I'm showing um, five depictions of simulated data. These are not real images. They're, they're not taken with telescopes. They are the simulated data rendered to look like observations. Um, so, you know, just to make sure that we really are looking at uh, a simulated galaxy that is somewhat realistic. Um, so I find hundreds of these mass analogs of the Milky Way in the simulation at the time equivalent to today. And around those Milky Way-like galaxies, I look for their satellite galaxies. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the most massive ones, um, so those that reach roughly 10% of the mass of the host they're orbiting around. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why we focus on the more massive ones. One of them is because the resolution limits of simulations like this um, are the most reliable at that mass regime. Uh, these simulations do not reproduce every single star in each of these simulated galaxies. Rather, they um, have a resolution such that one data particle might represent a few hundred stars. Um, and so in order to sort of have the exchange of reproducing many galaxies at once, you have to sort of sacrifice a bit of the, the resolution in terms of reproducing every individual star in every individual galaxy. Whereas if you were creating a simulation of just one galaxy, you could actually um, model every single star as an individual star. Um, and we can, we can talk more about that later if there's questions. Um, okay, so I look for satellite galaxies in these simulations, um, which means that I then end up with a sample of essentially a few hundred Milky Way-like galaxies surrounded by dozens of their own satellite galaxies themselves. And so I, I essentially have a large sample of simulated um, Milky Way-like galaxies uh, and their, their surrounding neighborhoods. Um, so just to recap quickly, the observations give us those precise 3D motions of the satellite galaxies, which then allow us to come up with orbits of the real Milky Way satellite galaxies. And where the simulations come in handy is that I end up having a large statistical sample of hundreds of these Milky Way-like galaxies and their associated satellites, um, by which I can use to understand um, you know, where our Milky Way fits in to the larger context of the universe. So if we're trying to understand whether the Milky Way is rare or if it's common, if there are other Milky Ways out there and the properties of our, of our local galactic neighborhood is, is very similar to those or if not. Um, so this is kind of how the observations and simulations um, serve two different purposes, but they do very much work hand in hand to help us answer some important questions. And some of those questions are, what is the frequency of satellites around simulated galaxies like the Milky Way? Um, so we can start to answer questions like, are we potentially missing some of the satellites? Have we actually found all of the satellites that are orbiting around our own Milky Way? Um, the short answer is no, we don't think we found all of them. Um, and as I showed you in the timeline at the beginning of my talk, many of the faintest satellite galaxies were only discovered in the last five or six years, um, again, because of very advanced technology. And so likely we will continue to find some more of these in the next five or 10 or 20 years as well. Um, Another question of interest is, is the Milky Way and its satellite system common or rare, as I mentioned already? Uh, are the orbital properties, so I showed you the animation of the orbits that we've calculated for some of the Milky Way satellite galaxies. So 
Um, if we, we generally know the, what we think are the correct shapes of these orbits and the time scales that it might take for them to merge into the Milky Way, we can compare those to the orbits of the many satellites we find in the simulations and again do a compare and contrast of whether that's typical or not. Um, and another interesting question is, what do the current orbital properties of satellites imply the properties of the host galaxy? So I mentioned how these satellites, if you know their orbits or can trace out their orbits in the simulations, they might tell you a little bit about the um, dark matter halos and their, the mass that's in the dark matter halos, the shape of those dark matter halos. So in the simulations, we do represent dark matter. Um, and so by comparing the properties of real Milky Way satellites to simula simulated Milky Way satellites, again, that's a way that we can um, shed some light on what are the properties of this dark matter that we can't again see when we look out to the universe with telescopes but that perhaps the simulations can give us a bit more insight on. Um, so this one of these questions is something that I've that I've worked on. How do you weigh a galaxy, especially the one you're in? Um, so I've I've done some work on this and if you're interested in it, um, there's a, a press release you could read if you want to know some more. Okay, in the very last few minutes of my talk, I just want to give you a case study of an, again another real project that I have worked on. That maybe will uh, give you a bit of a better idea of how we take all of these observations and simulations and actually put them into a real, real project. Um, so I will talk about the orbital history of Triangulum, which is also known as M33. Uh, just to give you a quick uh, reminder, so we have the Andromeda galaxy here, and Triangulum is its most massive satellite galaxy, which is shown here. Um, Triangulum is actually not a dwarf, like many of the other satellite galaxies. It's, uh, it's fairly massive. Um, and so one of the projects I worked on early in my graduate school career um, was trying to understand the orbital history of, of um, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, uh, as it moves around Andromeda. So here's another view of these two galaxies. Um, this image on the right that's shown in the, the gray, gray scale is um, from a real survey that was conducted in the region of Andromeda on the sky, um, Andromeda as well as M33. Um, and uh, this survey was actually the, the most remarkable survey done in this region in that it, it illuminated, quite literally, um, many of the faint structures that we see around the Andromeda galaxy that we didn't know about before. So these contours that are tracing out these sort of irregular straight shapes are all actually tracing out um, stellar over densities that are pointing us to uh, interesting sort of clumps of stars scattered about around the Andromeda galaxy um, that weren't found until uh, this, this survey was completed, I believe, in 2009. So again, just in the last decade. Um, you also see the Triangulum Galaxy in the bottom left down here. I've shown a, um, an image on, on the left. It's also what is in my background here. Um, and these contours, again, around, the Androm uh, around M33 are highlighting some stellar debris that was also discovered um, in just the last decade around the main body, uh, the main um, optical body of M33's disk. Um, so this question came up when the stellar debris around M33 was discovered, um, which is where does that extended stellar debris around M33 come from? Up until then, we, we had thought that M33 was this sort of nice spiral galaxy uh, that looked fairly ordered, um, but the discovery of this uh, stellar debris that is much more faint than the central gal galactic disk of M33 um, was quite surprising to find. And so from a dynamical point of view, um, the explanation for where that stellar debris came from was that, well, Triangulum must have passed around the Andromeda galaxy, um, perhaps in the last few billion years, at a close enough distance that the gravitational pull of Andromeda started to pull some of the stars away from Triangulum. Similar to that uh, artist depiction I showed a few times earlier in my talk where you saw the stars coming away in a stellar stream from the satellite galaxy orbiting around um, a central uh, galaxy. So this was sort of the original explanation, um, and this was just based on what we observed, what we saw in the shapes and the morphologies of the Triangulum Galaxy. Um, this, was, this was the best explanation that we could come up with at the time, um, given the data that was available. Again, this was, uh, this was more than a decade ago, um, and so things change and we get new data and we can uh, look back at these questions and maybe study them a little bit further. And so one of the things I did um, was that we gained proper motions for both the Andromeda galaxies. That was the video I showed you where we, we looked at the motion of stars in Andromeda with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we had the measurement of how the Andromeda galaxy is moving relative to the Milky Way. Um, and actually, we also have a proper motion measurement for the stars in Triangulum, which means that we could essentially figure out what is the orbit 
of Triangulum as it orbits around Andromeda. And we can actually um, model that now since we know, or we rather, we have a measurement for how, they're, how both of them are moving in three-dimensional space. Um, so what we found when we calculated those orbits, um, and we, we varied a, a few of the parameters to, to really try to make sure we maximized um, all of the potential caveats to this, um, but what we found is that it really looks like, based on the current measurements for how these two galaxies are moving, that Triangulum is only on its first passage around Andromeda. So that's what's shown in the sort of green trajectory here. Which means that M33, or, or Triangulum, is only at its closest point relative to, to, relative to Andromeda today. Meaning that if it didn't ever get close to Andromeda in the past, then this um, earlier explanation that it must, they must have gotten close to each other in order for that stellar debris to form um, may no longer hold. Um, so those are the results we found. Of course, this doesn't answer our original question, which is where did that extended stellar debris come from that we have observed around M33? Um, and so the next uh, answer we have to that is that interactions between Triangulum and satellite galaxies of itself may have led to the formation of that tidal um, stellar debris around the main body of uh, Triangulum's disk. Um, so this is again another active area that I'm working on. Uh, we're actually trying to get very, very deep observations around um, M33 to fill in this region that hasn't been surveyed very well um, yet to see if we can actually find some of these super, super faint, ultra faint dwarf galaxies in the outskirts around M33 that might actually help us um, understand whether interactions between um, M33, which is a satellite itself, and its own satellite population uh, may have played a role in, in what we're seeing today when we look out and, and observe um, M33. All right, so uh, I will leave you with that, and uh, I think we have some time for questions. Why don't we go ahead and just unmute your microphone if you have a question. I'll start off with a question. Sure. In your simulations, sure. are you putting or do the satellite galaxies have black holes? In? Um, black holes are in the simulations. Um, I have to go back and check the literature about whether um, any of the satellites have black holes in them. It's not a matter of putting the black hole into the satellite because um, the simulations, remember, are modeling the universe all the way from, from basic primordial fluctuations of density all the way through today. Um, and so it would be a matter of, uh, you know, black holes sort of growing within these galaxies. Um, I, yeah, I do not remember if uh, folks have looked at this yet. Uh, there are people looking observationally at dwarf galaxies, um, some of which are satellites to see if they do have real black holes in them um, from an observational standpoint. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know for sure if there are black holes in some of the satellites because this would probably be a resolution problem. Um, however, certainly the more massive galaxies do absolutely have black holes in them, especially the, the Milky Way-like galaxies. Any questions? Is it anticipated that M33 is going to move closer to Andromeda? Um, so in, um, you know, however many years, will there be more interaction between the two? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's quite a few things that we think will happen. Um, one is that, yes, it's certainly right now moving towards Andromeda. Um, and so it's essentially heading towards um, a pericentric passage, so its closest point in its orbit. Um, another thing that will happen shortly thereafter, or maybe shortly in a cosmological sense, but uh, a few billion years after that, uh, of course, is that the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies are supposed to start colliding with each other because they're also moving towards each other. Um, but the question of what happens to M33 in the process of that entire collision is a bit unclear. Um, though I have also worked on that question and, and calculated that. We think it might survive for quite some time. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, M33 is moving towards Andromeda, and then the, the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies are also collectively moving towards each other right now. Uh, it occurs to me that the error bars on uh, transverse velocity must be quite a bit higher than those for radial velocity. Absolutely. Well, doesn't that 
mean that you're going to kind of take a guess on the on the transverse? Yes, um, certainly that is a very valid point. Uh, radio velocities can be as precise as a few kilometers a second. Um, and these uh, transverse velocities can be as uncertain as tens up to even 100 kilometers a second, depending on um, which galaxy you're talking about. For something like Andromeda, since there are so many stars that we can observe um, a bit more easily, uh, those errors are not quite as large. Um, similarly for, for uh, M33, that's true as well. Uh, but when we actually go down towards, for example, these ultra faint dwarf galaxies where it's even hard to pick out 10 or 20 member stars, there's definitely a lot more uncertainty associated with those small numbers. Um, going back to M33 and Andromeda, yes, the uncertainty still does matter there and we do consider it. Um, and so it's folded into our orbital analysis. So while I, sh I, sh I showed essentially the main results of this, uh, we actually run tens of thousands of orbits and look at the aggregate of that collection where those orbits are sampling that uncertainty in the in the transverse motion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Somebody had asked if it's possible that we could be a satellite galaxy. The Milky Way? Yeah. Um, I think we know that we're not. Uh, mostly in that, again, in the context of the satellite galaxies I'm talking about here, um, we're really referring to the, the less massive dwarf-like galaxies. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily consider the Milky Way a satellite, but as I mentioned, since the Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda galaxy will eventually merge with each other, um, it, yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily say there it's a satellite, but it's certainly going to be in a binary galaxy situation in its future, um, where where our own galaxy will then you know do a dance in an orbit around uh, an equal, roughly equal mass galaxy. So we don't necessarily call it a satellite. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Uh, can someone hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so about how much of the, um, what's the, about the ratio of, let's say, dark matter to regular matter in a dwarf galaxy versus, a, I don't know, a spiral or major galaxy? Yeah, absolutely. Take my answer okay. off the air. Thanks. Yes. Thank you for a uh, nice talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll quickly recap and then answer the question. So for galaxies like the Milky Way, we think the dark matter is about 85% of the total mass. Um, when you move down to the dwarf range, and especially these ultra-faint dwarf galaxies, we think they're extremely dark matter dominated. Um, this is, again, something that we can learn by looking at the motion of the stars all relative to each other within, a, within one of those satellite galaxies. Um, and for example, for the, I guess, the most extreme case, um, we think that some of these galaxies could be dominated by 99% dark matter almost. Um, so it, it's quite quite a lot in that it really could just be a very small sliver of stars um, surrounded by a, a much more massive dark matter halo. So yeah, there is quite a bit of a range um, and it's definitely, it always goes in the trend of the least massive things typically are more dark matter dominated than their more massive counterparts. Uh, just to be clear on that 85% number, do you mean for, say, the Milky Way, uh, the whole thing is 15% visible and 85% dark? Correct. So why would smaller dwarf galaxies have more dark matter? Um, that's a great question. Uh, not one that we have a super solid answer to just yet, uh, but uh, let's say. So if we, if, I if we looked back at that, um, I can hopefully bring it up. If we go back to this sort of cosmic web where we see this filamentary dark matter structure. So the dark matter um, forms this structure uh, and sort of clumps up into various density um, regions we think first, and then the baryons start to form at the most densest, uh, in the most dense regions of dark matter. Um, and so we think that the, the smallest things form first, so the smallest galaxies form first, um, eventually growing into the larger galaxies, as I was talking about in the beginning, where um, you know, these satellites are fueling the growth of, of these Milky Way-like galaxies. Um, so there's a few reasons why the, the satellites might have more dark matter on average than, than let's say, stellar um, or baryonic matter. Um, one of those reasons is that uh, since these 
satellites or dwarf-like galaxies often are forming very early in the universe, they might shed a lot of their stars over that process, right? Either via the stars dying, because stars, of course, go through their own stellar evolutionary phases and they die over time and new stars are born. Um, another reason is that stars can be lost through gravity, right? So I showed uh, this, this artist's depiction of the stellar stream forming um, as a satellite orbited around its host. That's another mechanism by which stars can sort of be um, uh, you know, taken away from a galaxy. Um, let's see, any other obvious ones? Um, yeah, I'd say those. I'll say those are the two, the two, two sort of main reasons. It's essentially that they they're the oldest galaxies in the universe, and so they've essentially lived through, uh, let's say, you know, more experiences that would sort of take away a lot more of their stellar content over the time. Any other questions? Is there any uh, connection or relationship between these uh, dwarf galaxies and uh, globular clusters? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this kind of goes back to my, uh, the definition I showed of a galaxy in the beginning of the talk. Um, so yes, there's, there's a fine line, I would say, between what you define as a globular cluster and what you define as a satellite galaxy. The most basic definition to separate the two would be that we think the, the satellites have dark matter in them and that's how they're gravitationally bound together. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons why our definition for what is a galaxy has been changing so much. It's because we didn't know about these ultra faint dwarf galaxies until the last decade or so, or, or let's say the last 20 years. Um, and so there was a much more obvious separation in um, the kinematics of the stars and globular clusters versus dwarf galaxies um, in their spatial, um, in their actual physical sizes that they span. Um, as well as a few other properties in terms of, you know, what types of stars are in globular clusters versus um, satellite galaxies or dwarf galaxies. Um, so yeah, the, the definition is, is changing quite a bit. And certainly there is now um, a much less obvious division of the two. If you look at the properties of, of the populations of globular clusters in the Milky Way, compared to the population of dwarf galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way, um, their spatial extents and their masses and some of their other properties do start to overlap. Um, but there are a couple of properties that are still, you know, quite different that we think that they really are sort of two separate classes of objects. That was a good question. Are the stars in the small dwarf galaxies, are they predominantly small and very low metallicity stars? Yes. They are some of the oldest stars in the universe, and so they're very low metal city. Dr. Patel, this is Prashant. Uh, by the way, excellent talks. Um, the question I have is, what are the challenges that you face uh, doing this work? Um, and second question is, what is the what is the future of this work look like? Yeah, two, two very broad questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so some of the challenges are certainly that um, uh, somebody asked this earlier. Uh, of course, there are uncertainties, both with the observational measurements, but of course, the simulations as well, right? So um, some of this work operates on, you know, taking the simulations as truth, which of course, they may not be. There is some source of, um, you know, potential uncertainty in the simulations as well. Um, and so that's you know, something we always have to keep in the back of our minds as we're using simulations to provide context for the observations that we find um, or the observations we take and then use to interpret um, some of these topics. Uh, the future of this field, I think, is uh, very bright. <laughs> um, so if we're uh, talking about uh, future telescopes that are about to come, um, come online, we have the James Webb Space Telescope, which will peer further into the universe than we've ever, ever been able to see. So it'll you know, surpass the Hubble Space Telescope in its capabilities to see um, very faint objects uh, at, at much further distances than we, we've been able to see up until now. Um, there's also uh, the LSST project. This is another one of these digital sky surveys. Um, it'll be located in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. They will take their first light, I believe, next year. Um, it's actually been renamed the Vera Rubin Observatory recently, if anyone's uh, heard about that. Um, so this telescope uh, will do something similar to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the Dark Energy Survey in that it'll scan very large swaths of the sky to even deeper magnitudes than we've been able to do thus far. 
And so LSST is actually expected to help us find um, many more of the satellite galaxies that we think might be out there in the, in the galactic neighborhood, um, which would, you know, of course be an exciting new set of data that we can work with. Um, and that will also add to a lot of the analysis that we've already been working on with the current set of satellite galaxies we know about around the Milky Way. And the last thing I'll say about the future is that um, we have the most information, of course, about the satellite galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way, um, but we're approaching having more and more information for the satellite galaxies around the Andromeda galaxy as well. Um, so sort of the key to understanding the orbits of these satellites, uh, like I said, is, is having measurements of these proper motions, which are these incredible, incredibly small motions that require, um, you know, very advanced technology. Uh, and as you move further and further into space, uh, you have to wait longer and longer between the two sets of images you take to actually measure a proper motion. So for galaxies that are orbiting around the Milky Way, the timeline you have to wait between two sets of images of stars and some satellite galaxy to actually be able to measure um, a real proper motion can be about five or six or even um, sometimes as low as three years. But when you move further out to the satellites orbiting around the Andromeda galaxy, just because they're further away, you actually have to wait longer because the motion that they, they span across the sky is gonna be smaller. And so for the satellites that are orbiting around the Andromeda galaxy, you've got to wait on the order of more like a decade between two sets of images to then measure that proper motion and then do you know, a significant amount of analysis after that. Um, and so right now we, are, uh, we have measurements for four of Andromeda's satellite galaxies' proper motions. There's about 35 known satellite galaxies orbiting around Andromeda, so we've got a bit, bit of a way to go. Um, but actually, my, uh, my mentor here at UC Berkeley, um, myself and many collaborators, have uh, we have a successful proposal in for the Hubble Space Telescope that's going to start taking a lot of the imaging um, to get that first set of images for all of the rest of the satellite galaxies orbiting around Andromeda. So we would have that first, um, we, we call it a baseline, so we would essentially have the first set of images so that later, perhaps with Hubble, if it's still working, or with the James Webb Space Telescope, we could maybe in 10 or 20 years, take that secondary image and then have proper motions, not only for all or most of the Milky Way satellite galaxies, but also for all of um, the Andromeda galaxies satellites as well. So that's kind of the direction we're moving, is moving away from just our own galaxy and the satellite system orbiting around it, but also moving towards um, you know, other, other systems of satellite galaxies as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was perfect. Um, just just wanted to let you know that I have my two daughters, thirteen and eight, uh, hearing to your talks, and they're very inspired right now. Do you oh, have any thanks. message for them? Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm glad they're watching. I want to thank you. Sure. Thank you for thank inviting. Thank for for filling in for our other speaker who had couldn't make it, but. I think we'll uh, call it. All right. Can I ask a quick question? Right now? Um, uh, but, but people can leave if they want. Just a quick question. Are these stars um, in the dwarf galaxies population three or two? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We think a lot of them could be potentially. Yep. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So called first stars in the galaxies. Yep. Well, thank you for a wonderful talk. Sure. Thank Enjoy you. It. Applause. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Patel. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.